with the Atlanta Beltline now making its way into Cabbage Town. The graffiti-covered Crog Street Tunnel and these unique murals on the rail yard have become the public image of Cabbage Town's art scene. Most of these are from artists all over and commissioned by such organizations like Living Walls. Well, Atlanta has a booming uh, mural scene. It started about seven years ago. Um, and uh, to a large degree, Living Walls really helped invigorate Atlanta's mural scene and made it into an international scene. Um, the city of Atlanta has also sponsored a lot of murals by street artists through the um, Elevate Arts program, which is a public art uh, program that's temporary. It's generally held seasonally, but in particular in, in October, uh, we have an annual event that celebrates the arts um, for a week. And um, I can say that Atlanta has uh, su you know, supported the mural art scene and has offered opportunities to mural artists um, in recent years since the inception of Elevate in 2011. Well, you know, public art increases the quality of our lives. Um, you know, it enlivens our, our downtown streets, um, it connects neighborhoods, it can actually be transformative in creating a gateway or an I I iconic uh, focal point for a community to rally around. Um, Atlanta has great public art. It celebrates our legacy as uh, a city that's inventive, that uh, has a human rights and civil rights legacy, and we have a really diverse collection of art, meaning that all, all, all of our citizens are able to participate in, a, in the public art process. We have a great collection of diverse artwork, and it should be celebrated. It's not graffiti if you have permission, and Living Walls has facilitated over 100 public murals featured throughout the metropolitan area. Andrew Lovell is one Cabbage Town artist who talks about the power of the murals. What we're seeing is a total redefinition of what graffiti is and what public art is. So the cool thing I think is just that line of you know public art and graffiti. You know, um, and you know there's some real obvious things that make one or the other. But we're definitely seeing people moving from one world to the other, and typically they're moving from graffiti to public art and not the other way around. But when we look deeper into the neighborhood and the artists that actually live here, we find a plethora of artists complete with their unique stories and histories. It's not just the murals that are on display, as the assortment of talent is prolific, and the people are creating here in Cabbage Town every day. Today we go beyond the murals as we get an inside look at some of the artists of Cabbage Town as we get a glimpse into their unique artistic process. This is Art Comes Alive. Reverend David DeChant has been a cabbage head since 1998. And when he needed something to do as the kids went to school and his wife to work, David taught himself to sculpt. One of his most infamous creations is his 22 foot, 30,000 pound granite shark called Man in Shark, which has since been pared down to 10,000 pounds. This home project took him two years to complete. Cabbage Town, the word itself in the 50s and 60s meant the ghetto. It meant the poor part of town. And it meant that because it smelled like cabbage because cabbage is cheap and people cooked cabbage and that's why this neighborhood is called that. Cabbage Town is very village-like. You know, we walk to the restaurants, we meet each other on certain streets, on at certain restaurants, at, certain, at people's houses and things like that. And you don't really get that much anymore. In Cabbage Town, you have the remnants of a mill town. 
all of these houses, everything here was meant to serve the Fulton County Cotton Mill. You know, it was all about living here for free or for very little and working there. And it was like the Pullman Yards. It was an old formula for eventually you'll own your home. And when they went to fill these jobs, nobody wanted them. <laughs> and so the reason a lot of Appalachians are here is because they went into the mountains and said, you can come down to the big city and own a piece of property. It'll be worth a lot more money and you'll get a job, you'll have insurance, and you, all of those things. It was appealing at that time. They had local police officers. There was a Cabbage Town guy who would go around and make sure you weren't gambling. And you know, it, it was like morality patrol. It was a very strange, very limited society for a long time. And when people started moving away from that, started selling their houses and things like that, it became what it is today. It's really post cotton mill in its, in, in its inception. We, we don't really know how to categorize ourselves, but we have turned into this wonderful thing. There is a great art scene in this neighborhood because it has become kind of the, the warehouse of art. The murals, are the obvious, the, the murals are seen by everyone from out of town as being the artsy fartsy part of the neighborhood. Now, murals are different from graffiti. There are words in the tunnel, but they're typically the graffiti artist's name or just some bomb word that they put out there all the time. The murals are temporary. They're not meant to, to live forever. Yours gets tagged, someone else puts a mural over it. It, it. It's supposed to just be a bit of art, but it's supposed to be a bit of art and not a bit of graffiti. I think people don't realize, they think that we're the graffiti area. No, we have paintings on the walls. We don't have graffiti that just says some guy's name or some phrase. And so that's a big difference to me. Graffiti implies that it's derelict or it's the broken window thing, you know? It's just like, well, it's dirty, let's make it more dirty. The murals are art. These are things that people come, they've got 50 colors and they're shading and they're doing all of the things that you would do on a canvas if you were a canvas painter. The, the, the entire phrase written in stone is all about what I do. I like to chisel it in stone so that it's there forever. I don't want the meaning to change over time. I don't want the implications to change over time. I want it to be a fountain forever, or a bench, or a shark, or... I typically do a lot of hardscape stuff. I move earth, I move boulders, I shape stone and wood. Um, Whatever it is people are paying me to do, I do. But when I do what I choose to do, it typically is a very heavy thing that's supposed to live forever. If I'm over here making art, people are inspired to make art. And uh, I get a lot of people just poking their head over the fence going, so what's going on over here? What's this property all about? And as I'm walking them around and I'm showing them the place, they always say something to the effect of, I really thought I would take up welding. And I used to crochet, you know, like they, they're reflective about art that they could have done or should have done or maybe she'll still should do. And I think that it's it's sort of addictive. It's it's kind of contagious. Art art should be that way. I do that whenever I go to the High Museum. I come home and do something as soon as I can because I'm so inspired to do it. I think of legacy all the time when I'm doing things, but as an artist, you have to sell it to somebody or it's valueless or it's meaningless. So I think sometimes in terms of my patron's legacy, what do they need to last forever? Not what I need to last forever. One thing for the true artist is the compulsion to do it. I do it because I have to. Um, I would say that might be true of some muralists, but I think also it's a trendy thing to do. You want to get your art out there. You want to be able to say, I did that bridge on such and such a street. Um, I like to build things that are going to be here forever, and I'm compelled to do it whether they make money or not. I certainly have not gotten rich in any way, shape, or form on my art. I'm just compelled to do it.
Andrew Lovell is another artist who's a fan of the beauty of decay, where the industrial meets the artistic aesthetic that is Cabbage Town. Uh, let's see, my wife and I bought a house on Savannah Street in uh, 2002, I think is when it was. But before that, I uh, had a studio at a place called The Art Farm, which is basically in Cabbage Town, just down the street. So I started coming over to the neighborhood and, you know, kind of being a part of Cabbage Town a couple years before that. Um, we were definitely part of the uh, kind of first gentrifying wave, so to speak. So, I, you know, we, as far as gentrification goes, I think that we're, everybody's part of, you know, one movement or another. Um, but we were kind of early adopters of the Cabbage Town. And, and yeah, I identify with, uh, I, the studio I rented in Cabbage Town uh, really kind of set me on a course, you know, because there's an aesthetic that kind of comes with Cabbage Town and which was happened to fit me perfectly. Um, and so when I started coming here and I remember very specifically driving through the, the Crog Street Tunnel and coming over here at night and, and being like, okay, I'm doing it because I have an art, I have my own studio. It's in a, 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 a neighborhood that I just adore, you know, and that the look of it is perfect for me. And, and it kind of set me on a path to paint a lot of things based around the neighborhood, specifically the mill. You know. One of the, I think probably the landmark of Cabbage Town, you know, is the Fulton Mill or the, I think it's Fulton Bag and Seed Mill, if they call it. But, you know, these big uh, iconic um, smokestacks, you know, which is, uh, you know, once again, you, you pretty much, you know, anywhere you are in Cabbage Town, you know, you can kind of get a glimpse of these stacks kind of sticking up over the top of the, the A-frame roofs. And I think, you know, like for me, like there's just something about that looming in the background, this kind of old school uh, mill worker, uh, you know, I mean, this is just a such a hardcore lifestyle. You know, it's just something that just doesn't exist anymore. So. For me, the, the stacks, the big smoke stacks, um, you know, I think they're works of art. You know, the, the bricks laid, you know, these thousands of bricks making these round structures. They're like obelisks, you know, in a, in a lot of ways. I, that's what I see them as, as some kind of memorial to like the industrial revolution or kind of thing. So, so you, you can't miss it. You come into Cabbage Town, you can kind of triangulate where you are by like, oh, okay, there's the stacks. I see the stacks there. So it, I, I have a big, I'm just really into those sort of structures, the work I make. Um, it's pretty much based on that kind of form and function, you know. Like what makes a smokestack work is what makes it beautiful and why it's so tall and, you know, why, you know how it's made is it's really interesting to me. So a lot of my work is kind of informed by, you know, this, this kind of aesthetic. Lots of notes. I think what attracted me was the fact that you still had a lot of the original residents or relatives of the original residents, you know, like our house on both sides, you know, down the street, a few houses, you know, we had uh, relatives of the original kind of mill, mill town folks, you know, and I think as an artist, you, you're always seeking something original or something, you know, unique or core kind of. And so like, it was probably more that, you know, that was something to feed off of and then immediately meeting a group of people who kind of felt the same way, but really couldn't put it into words exactly why they liked it or why they were here. Um, but I think it's that authenticity, you know, that people just, whether you subconsciously or not, you know, you kind of, you're down with it because you're like, oh yeah, you know, this is a real thing, you know, bigger than yourself, you know, older than, than yourself. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think Cabbage Town, you know, the thing that, you know, inspires a lot of artists here is that it, it has a sense of that it's frozen in time, you know, that you've got all the bones of this old, old, old school neighborhood. And I mean, I think, I think it's fantastic. I do. I mean, because I, I, you know, remember, you know, it wasn't that long ago that, uh, you know, where you painted your tag or mural now, but, you know, like the street artists, you know, are, you know, that it's in the name. They're street artists, you know. So uh, Cabbage Town happens to have the CSX yard and the mill right there. There's a lot of natural, just occurring like walls and, and barriers. And um, if you live in the neighborhood and you, you know, you're driving these streets or going through, you know, to work every day, you know, I think that, you know, what they've done with uh, living walls and, and just managing the murals, I think it's fantastic, you know, uh, because 
that's what really art should do anyway. It's, it's supposed to, to uplift and kind of bring a perspective. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago when people were just kind of tagging over and, you know, and you've got, you've got a really great piece and you've got some really crappy stuff right on top of it, next to it. And I think what's happened now is just, there's just been this kind of level up of everybody. So, you know, if you want, if you've got a piece on the walls down here now, you know, you're, you're a relatively, if you can say it, legitimate street artist. You know, of course, you still have your regular tags and all that stuff, but I just think the level of work is it's just uh, exponentially better. Um, and, you know, technically this is free artwork for people to enjoy on a daily basis, which is kind of, you know, uh, bucks the system, you know, and I think that's, if anything, that's what art's supposed to do as well, is, is it's supposed to be available to, to everyone. And, uh, you know, so we, we have these amazing galleries of, of work and it rotates and changes much like a regular gallery. Um, and there's some sense of order to it now. So, you know, I'm a huge fan of that. I think it's a, it's a really great addition to the city and the neighborhood, you know, altogether. It's a destination, I think, for a lot of people because it's just so unique. Um, there aren't a lot of neighborhoods that have the same aesthetic and, or the same setup. And then if you're an artist, you know, you immediately kind of feel like this is a funky neighborhood, you know. I can, you know, your freak flag is absolutely welcome. So I think that everybody kind of immediately keys in on that when they come in and they go, like, oh, wow, okay. Ferguson, a painter, loves the eccentricity of Cabbage Town, and her illustrations display the simple aspects of life and the beauty of everyday homes. Um, I, I came to painting uh, a, a little bit by accident. I decided at one time that I really didn't like the whole um, aspect of Christmas shopping and the whole uh, materialism of it, and I decided I was going to start making gifts. And so the first year I made people little little recipe books of my favorite recipes. And then the following year I decided I was gonna do little paintings. Well, I did, uh, while hanging out at a friend's house during a snowstorm, I did a painting of her house and I didn't take any of it seriously. I just thought it was very humorous. Um, but the people there liked it. And so I started doing more of them and then people kept ordering them. So I did it for about five years and I'm, I'm really glad that I was able to develop um, that part of creativity and I have come to understand how it, how it mirrors uh, the quest for creative composition in writing um, and, and how you both, in both uh, medium, mediums, you start with a blank page of sorts and you're filled with doubt and you don't know what's gonna come out and then you just have to find a way to start making it happen and then you do. I moved in, I moved in to Cabbage Town about 13, 14 years ago. And I think the atmosphere at that time was um, one of uh, not just alternative lifestyle, but sort of underground in a way, but unheralded underground. In other words, if you were to drive through Cabbage Town at the time, um, you would think, well, this place is a mess and it's probably unsafe and, and this and that. But if you were to be exposed to it, the parties and the gatherings, um, you, you would just be compelled to it. Um, if, you have, if you have a thread within you that has, that feels in other settings like an outsider. In other words, Cabbage Town has always um, been home to, to outsiders, people who have been um, castigated or looked down upon by other areas. You know, even back in the day, you had Grant Park, which would have been an upper middle class neighborhood, and Inman Park, which was very posh. And Cabbage Town was just the, uh, the stereotypical white trash. And there's something about the spirits of those people that draws other people who feel like they don't necessarily fit into uh, more, 
into into climates where there are more where there are stricter regulations governing how you behave. I do draw inspiration from Cabbage Town, and it's uh, because it's um, it's an unaffected, um, uh, very real and genuine existence. And um, in in a way, I'm untrained, and uh, I I really don't care for the um, sort of the uppity aspect of expensive art. So it's more just like Cabbage Town feels like a very comfortable but old chenille robe. That's sort of the paintings reflect that too. They're, they're just relaxed and it is what it is. And so I would say so. I would say that in that way, my paintings reflect the atmosphere in which I live. Yeah, it, because artistic people in general are, uh, li live a wider uh, range of experience. And so uh, they need more room to just to experience things and to and to experience other people and other situations. They need more stimulation. Susan McCracken is a glass artist who loves to get lost in her work. Her no-nonsense attitude is a staple of the determination of the local artists in Cabbage Town. Um, I just fell into it because I can draw, and that's how I started doing, I did the architectural rendering. I was just trying to think, find a way to make a living with being able to draw, and I just kind of fell into this and found a niche and went with it. This is my third career, and I uh, used to do architectural renderings, and that became obsolete because of computers. And then I went from that doing designs uh, for real, realtors and I just started designing stained glass windows for a couple of studios around town and I would go from studio to studio and do their designs and their layouts for the artists to build the, the to build the windows and then I just decided to one day I just went into the studio and decided to do it myself. I learned kind of osmosis what we're doing the drawings for the studios and um, they were big studios with multiple employees and multiple tables and I, just from being there every day I just kind of picked it up and learned it. And so then from that and the measurements that I take I had to really measure because this is covering up mullions on the windows. So from that I do a, a layout drawing on gridded paper. I have rolls and rolls of gridded paper. And then the, the pattern I cut the glass out and then I let it together with the lid. This is the lid. It comes in strips like and it's very pliable, oh, okay. and it you know just got a channel, and then you solder the intersections. These these are my tools right here. That's the tools I use. People did the, in the old days. They had a, they would wax what they call wax up the windows, and they had a big sheet of glass, and they would cut the glass the window out and put wax on it and stick it to the glass and look at the whole thing before they put it together. But for this to be a light box wouldn't work because if you look at this, here's a kajillion nail holes in this because I actually build the window nail it to the table when I build it. So I use these uh, little tiny horseshoe nails and, and uh, actually nail it down. Yeah, see here's the pattern under here. It's under here. So I draw it out and I write phone numbers all over it when I'm working. But I draw it out and build it on top of this paper. And then here's the um, pattern. So this was the pattern for these pieces, see? Little patterns. But but I don't save these, so I mean I just kind of I go and I talk to them and I look around their house and they ask them a lot of questions about what they're looking for and what they like. And then I do drawings for them. And then they they decide from the drawings that I do, or maybe we they like something about this drawing, something about that drawing, then we put those drawings together and, and then from that drawing. I build it. But the best part about that is when you deliver it and you look at the people's faces when they see it and you take it out of the truck and you, the first time they put, lay their eyes on it, they get real excited. It's more of a decorator, designer medium now. It's more of a compliment to a room than it is an art form. So I feel like I'm more of a facilitator, you know, for a designer or an interior decorator or a homeowner. Um, if I want to do something artistic, um, I'll just, a lot of times some people will say, well, build what you want, and I'll do something really different. 
but usually it's just like this, just something sort of traditional, more of a craft than an art. But walking the line between art and commerce can prove difficult. I find that I just work all the time because you don't want to turn anything down because you don't know when the next job is going to come. But I've been really fortunate to be busy, really busy the last, I don't know, since the recession. Because during the recession, I, I was like a bartender, you know, <laughs> doing crazy stuff. But I, it's been, I've been really fortunate to have a lot of work lately. And I get most of it word of mouth or online, my website. Or If you say you're a working artist, I mean, that's, I don't know, I think that's a certain amount of luck involved with that in the first place because, you know, most of the time if you're making something that's inspired, it's all speculative and whether or not it'll sell or not, who knows, you know, whether or not you can make some money off of it. Um, but it kind of has to be that way if you're led only by that, then, then you're, you know, once again, you're just headed down that commoditization path. So. Um, Everybody's got a different lifestyle, different concerns. So for me, it is hard. It's hard to balance the two. I have a family and a wife, you know, and it's, it, it takes a lot. There's a real divide between like the artistic uh, mentality and the drive to make art, and then the other, which is to try to, you know, um, you know, collate and commoditize, you know. And this is, you know, there's no art industry without the curating and the commoditization of it. So, you know, the. Most artists, you know, a lot working artists have that industry to thank for being able to make a living. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that commoditization truly undermines what real art is. So. so the next time you're walking through Cabbage Town and you see this amazing artwork, remember, it's the people that occupy this unique space and are taking this historic district into the future. Thanks for watching.